So you can become very powerful early on in Baldur's Gate 3. There are a lot of weapons just in the starting hours that can give you a ton of extra damage, ways to apply heal or even shock damage on every hit, and a lot of amazing party-wide utility to help you out in almost any situation. So we're gonna cover all of that and more in this video and let's jump right in. But you can get possibly the best early on greatsword right from the tutorial area as you make your escape from the mothership. Eventually you're going to reach this room where you will encounter a boss fight between a Mind Flayer and Commander Zhulk. However, do not run just yet and finish the cutscene, instead linger around and try to take this boss down. Yes, it's going to be difficult and there are gonna be some reinforcements coming in about like 10 turns, but if you try to take it down before that happens and immediately loot the body, you can get this really awesome greatsword right here called the Everburn Blade. So this hasn't changed much since the early access days, it still deals the same amount of damage, a 2d6 plus 3 slashing plus an extra 1d4 in fire damage, which means it can get perfectly coupled with something like a paladin that already applies burning effects and other sources of fire damage with its smite abilities, but it can also work on something like a barbarian or a fighter or anything that has proficiency with two-handed greatswords. And speaking of proficiencies, it also comes with three abilities if you have that. So this includes a cleave, a lacerate, and a way to daze enemies as a main action. And again, this carried me all the way to level 10. There are obviously much better options later on, but it can literally carry you a lot of levels and a lot of hours before having to change to anything. Now, if you somehow miss this, there are other options that come in a bit later. One of them actually given to you from the main story, but it can be completely missable. So this is called the Soro, this is a glaive and it also adds some extra psychic damage on every hit. But to get this you need to complete the grove side of the mission, so you need to go and visit the druids, help them up with their situation and also follow the leads towards Helsin so that you can rescue him from the nearby goblin stronghold. There are going to be some bosses in there that you have to defeat but eventually you can either help him and he will also make his own way back to the grove. From this point on, also go back to the grove, talk to him and make your way to the enclave library which you do by following this path back into the same location where you talked with the healer previously. Before reaching the healer, talk to Wrath first which is going to give you this slate right here, the wolf rune so that you can insert it in the puzzle ahead. From this point on, go back to the healer room and then another room behind it with this big statue of an owl that also has some glowing effects on it. So you're going to see this pedestal right here on the side, if you activate this you're going to be able to place the rune of the wolf inside of it and then activate the whole puzzle to reveal a hidden path below it. And inside of it you're going to spot the sorrow glaive on one of these well tables as well as a bunch of other loot that you should grab right away. Now this has suffered some really massive changes compared to the early access, it no longer has any downsides, only upsides. So the damage is better, 1d10 plus 5 and it also gets an extra 1d4 of fire which is going to be really good. But most important, it loses the penalty of using it which was the psionic damage that was damaging you when attacking enemies with this weapon. You no longer have that penalty and you also get the weapon enchantment plus 1 that we had before. But instead of the ensnare mechanic it previously came with, now it has the Sorrowful Lash which lets you pull in enemies. So probably even better now for Lysel or any other like melee character to just pull in targets and get them closer to you so that you can damage them quickly. But since we spoke about rescuing Helsin, yeah, there's also another weapon in there that you can get for Asterion or pretty much any thief or any kind of like rogue subclass because this is a very strong dagger you can only get from here and if you wait too long it's going to eventually disappear. So very early in the stronghold you're going to reach this area with some uh, very non-advertiser friendly kind of stuff that I'm going to avoid talking about but on the side of this table there are two ritual weapons including the ritual dagger. So you will have to steal these because if you wait for too long eventually the NPCs here will take them and you can no longer take them. So during this moment try to use a Asterion and try to sneak around to grab it Otherwise, if you get caught stealing, just use a high charisma character to get yourself out of that situation or re-roll the dice until that is successful, otherwise you have to fight your way out of it. But the ritual dagger is a very strong option for any thief because if you put this in your offhand, you now have a bonus attack action with the dagger on top of everything else. So this means you can attack 
two up to four times with a thief because you have an additional dagger plus its main effect is the pain maiden's blessing so after a successful attack with this dagger the wielder receives a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws until the end of their next turn so this is going to increase your weapon damage every single time you use it for the next turn so once you start it rolling it's going to eventually last for the entire fight almost until you no longer attack with it it also comes with the blood sacrifice active which if you use you get some damage done onto you but at the same time it provides you a 1d4 to attack rolls and saving throws on top of what it already has by default so pretty good option nonetheless now the next one is possibly the best buffing weapon in the entire game and especially since it can literally work all the way into the super late game so this is called the Staff of Arcane Blessing and just like what the name implies, it comes from the Arcane Tower that you get to explore in the Underdark. So eventually you're going to have to power up this tower which is something that you do by just taking this path right here from the second floor and jumping all the way down to its base. Here you can just knock down the door using any slashing damage but before going to the generator make sure you just track your way back and grab the Susur flowers from this tree on to the left side once you do that go back activate the tower this is going to also power up the generators and turn off any of the turrets in the area from this point on make your way to the top of the tower where you will have to fight some enemies but one of these enemies is also going to drop a legendary ring that ring only has one purpose so if you put it on it's going to reveal a hidden button on the main platform this is going to bring you to the basement so activate this go to the basement and on the top of the stairs to your right side you're going to see the staff of the arcane blessing right here and you can grab it so this comes with a very interesting effect because essentially it makes blessing an already amazing spell to become even stronger so on top of the fact that you get the bless mechanic you also get mistrust blessing whenever you cast this spell so this is going to give you an additional 1d4 to saving throws and weapon attack rolls as well as an additional 2d4 to spell attack rolls but um, the tooltip is a bit confusing so let me break it down to you essentially there are two components to it so this just replaces bless you still get the same amount of 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving rolls but um, otherwise you also get mistrust blessing on top which only applies the 2d4 to spell attack rolls so this is going to mostly benefit a lot more something like a spellcaster or anything that also incorporates spells into their attacks or into their gameplay. This is, yeah, the spell for that, but most of the classes in the game have something like that. This is why Shadowheart is probably the best character to wield this in case you don't main a cleric yourself. Now the next set of weapons you get to choose between are right here up north on the Risen Road. You have to rescue the Grand Duke from a burning tavern. But once you get them safely out of that building, they will give you the option between these three weapons, including a trident, a longbow, as well as a staff. Now personally, I went with the Jolt Shooter because there aren't many great longbow options early on and this just fits the theme so well. But otherwise, all of these provide pretty much the exact same effect, which is, well, providing you two lightning charges whenever you attack enemies with these weapons. So you have to actually hit them for the charges to apply. But once you reach five lightning charges, your next attack will also unleash a lightning strike against that target and possibly electrify them if they happen to be wet. So you can also use these to stun them if you have the chance at that. And they can even be coupled with other similar shock related items like for example the speedy light feet which also provides you three lightning charges when you use a dash. This is actually a really good combo on the thief. You can use dash as a bonus action with this class at the start of any fight and then immediately unleash a jolt shooter hit which is going to immediately give you the five lightning charges. So basically you can ensure you get a lightning strike on an enemy every single turn with this and by the way once you get the charges every single one of your attacks can apply a lightning strike so even if you use a melee attack after you get the charges it's going to work for that too so very good on the thief if you get a lot of extra bonus actions on top of your original ones 
But moving on, almost in the same area, maybe even before reaching the tavern, you're going to encounter this very large group of like half dog enemies, one of which is the leader called Azriel. And if you defeat this group as well as their leader, you can grab the shattered flare from its body. This is an amazing bludgeoning weapon, it comes with a 1d6 plus 3, but also with the Ying Hu gift effect. So basically this is an on hit heal kind of weapon, every single hit with this weapon is going to heal you between 1 to 6 hit points, which is actually really good, but you can also go mad with this character if you don't continue to hit the same enemy each turn, so there's also that downside. But it also has some weapon enchantment plus two over here, a really great option to have for something like a fighter, which can get a lot of hits in in the same turn. Something like Lysel, for example, can attack even up to four or five times in the same turn with this, so you can essentially almost bring yourself to half HP just because you're using this. Now there's one great sword left that I still want to cover and that's going to be the Sword of Justice. You get this from Anders in the mission called Hunt the Devil, also here in the Risen Road, just a little bit east of these camps we just talked about. But if you complete this mission, no matter which path you choose in it, eventually you're gonna be given this sword either as a reward or as a drop. But this is very similar actually to our Burning Blade, maybe even an upgrade depending if you of course want some extra utility on top. This comes with a 2d6 plus 4 instead of plus 3 that we had on the previous weapon, which means it compensates for its lack of fire damage. And not just that, you can also like just imbue this with fire damage from like a candle or just using the action to um, dip this into some fire source. So it can actually deal more damage than the fire weapon. But uh, otherwise, it also comes with tears protection and this is essentially an AC boost of plus 2 on the character that you cast this on. So you can increase their armor class by 2 points, making them a lot more tanky. Especially if you play as a paladin, it can be a great source of making yourself a lot more tanky or just helping some of your other teammates to survive a bit longer because of it. Now, I didn't switch to this from the Burning Blade. I still think the Burning Blade deals more damage and especially because of the fire over time. But um, you can, of course, have this as an alternative. And finally, we have the best items you can get in the starting hours, which are the Githyanki armor set, heavy armor set actually, and the great sword, both that you get by being hostile to the crash right here up northwest near the mountain pass. So you have to choose the dialogue option that makes you hostile and defeat them, but be warned, these are extremely tough enemies at this point. So I recommend using something like invisibility, use potions to boost your damage and your stats, and also use the high ground provided by these platforms near the bridge, maybe even collapse those stairs so that they don't make their way up to you. But if you use mages and other spellcasters and other ranged characters, you should not have much trouble defeating them. And one of the items you get is the Githyanki Greatsword. On top of the really amazing 2d6 plus 5, you also get a 1d4 psychic damage. But you have to be of a Githyanki race to benefit from the extra psychic damage. So this includes Lysel in this case. If you don't have another option, you can just give it to her and she's going to become an absolute powerhouse. Plus, you also get a couple of really awesome medium Githyanki armors. They look really awesome. Plus, they provide quite a bit of like damage mitigation in there, so it can help you a ton if you can use this with your party. But this is it. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.